Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Ilve Niokikchin. I'm a photographer, photojournalist from the Netherlands. Uh, even though I was based in South Africa most of the time throughout the last 12 years. But since COVID, I am mostly in the Netherlands. So today I want to talk about uh, finding your narrative. There might be some people in here, I know at least one of them, uh, that are here for Jasper Doost, before I forget to mention that. He unfortunately has COVID, so he is back at home in the Netherlands. And then World Press Photo asked me to step in, and I'm very happy that I got this chance, because I really like being here, and I love the photo festival, so yeah, I'm glad I can be here. So finding your narrative, um, I've been working as a photojournalist for the last 15 years, and finding the narrative is one of the most important things as a storyteller that you have to do. And it's also one of the most difficult things, because how do you find your narrative? I'm going to sit down to be a bit closer to the laptop. I'm going to show you some images that I took throughout the last 15 years. It's quite a random order. They all have one thing in common, and I'm gonna tell you at the end of this little uh, show of images. I think there's about 10 images, and then I'm gonna tell you what the common thing is. Some of these images were taken for the New York Times, for who I work quite regularly, uh, and for other magazines uh, as well, for American magazines, a lot of German magazines like Der Spiegel and Stern, uh, for some Dutch newspapers. I think the one thing you can see from my images is the fact that they <laughs> all have in common that it includes people. But that's not the main thing. It was actually because of the world press, actually. 10, 11 years ago, I won an award, or 10 years ago. And that was the reason that I kind of found my visual narrative. Can we turn off this light, maybe? Ah, we can't. OK, it's OK. So the award I won in 2012 was won in the category Contemporary Issues. And I'm not a native English speaker. I think most of you here also aren't. And I didn't know what a contemporary issue was. I won in that category, but I literally didn't know what it was. And back then I had to look it up. So I'm going to read it to you as well in case you don't know what a contemporary issue is. It's an issue that is currently affecting people or places, and it's unresolved. And then I knew what my kind of visual narrative was, because I knew these were already always in the last 15 years, the stories that I'm mostly attracted to. So what I did after winning the award, I googled what are contemporary issues, and there were hundreds of different subjects of contemporary issues. And I realized right away that things like equal rights, women's rights, homelessness, hunger and nutrition, indigen indigenous rights, um, let's see, there's more, uh, climate change, of course, education, the cost of living. These were all stories I worked on throughout the years. Without knowing, I was photographing contemporary issues. So when I kind of found that word, it gave me a direction to work on other stories in this same line. So finding your narrative can come in many ways. Finding your visual voice is just a lot of practicing. You find your way by doing. You find your way by taking more pictures. But to find stories, there are actually tricks to do that. Really, it's not impossible. I wrote a few things down. First of all, look for a subject that matches you. It sounds like so simple, but you basically have to think of the subjects that touch you har your heart when you hear about them. So in my case, this is contemporary issues. That doesn't mean that has to be the same for you, but as a photojournalist, 
I'm touched by those kind of stories. So I kind of know which stories I want to focus on. I also know that most of the projects I work on take years. I worked on my last project for 12 years. I have worked on projects in the last three years that really took many years. So pick something that you really love, really love, that you can take loads of time to shoot it because you, you are just so, so much interested. Keep a growing list of ideas. I have a list in my phone. It's an endless list. Half of it I've never touched. Half of it I pitch to clients and I start working on it. And the list grows, but also my archive grows. I keep shooting and I keep doing the stories I like. One thing I would really do is cooperate with others. Make sure you work closely with journalists, with artists, researchers, scientists. Find ways to connect to other people in places like this and learn from each other as well and try to find what inspires you. I'm sure many of you already know what inspires you, but I know as a storyteller, you can get lost quite easily along the way. I have done that, I see everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I've done that many times where I don't know anymore which story to focus on. Specialize yourself, but don't narrow it down too much. I worked in Africa for 12 years, so at one stage, a lot of people knew I was that photographer working in sub-Saharan Africa. So I was not getting any assignments anywhere else. And I really felt like, hey, you can also send me to Asia, or you can send me to Afghanistan. It didn't happen because I specialized so much. So I knew I had to branch out myself if I wanted to go to other stories and other places. And the last one, follow current issues. This doesn't have to be, if not necessarily if you're a journalist like me. I follow current issues because I live from like reading the newspaper and I work for newspapers. But even if you are not interested in, in the news, current issues are something that affect us all. So if you're making artwork or anything else, try to find stories there and they will come to you naturally because you will figure out which ones you like best. Okay, so I'm only going to show you one story today. And it's the story I worked on for 12 years. And the story happened quite naturally. In 2004, I lived in South Africa for one year. I moved back in 2007 and lived there for two more years. I was working for a newspaper there. I studied photojournalism in the Netherlands. Sorry, I studied journalism in the Netherlands. I was supposed to study photojournalism, but the teacher got sick. So we never had any photo class. Everything I learned throughout the years, I taught myself, which was really a pity. But what I did learn in school was researching, researching and writing. So I can write my own stories, I can research my own stories, and that really helps. So in 2007, I was working at a South African newspaper. It's called The Star in Johannesburg. And I worked there for about two years. And the assignments I was getting there, I was a full staff photographer there. The assignments I was getting there were very newsy. And I realized I'm more a long-term storyteller. And all the newsy stories, yeah, were not really for me, even though in the beginning I thought I was a really tough news journalist. I figured out I wasn't. What I also realized in South Africa, whatever new story I was sent on, the young people of South Africa were always there. If there was a riot, they were in front rioting. If there was a demonstration in school, they were there. South African youth was so active. I'm from the Netherlands. The youth in the Netherlands have such an organized life. The government pays for everything, so there's hardly any poverty. So we didn't have to riot for anything. Our lives were very organized. But I realized in South Africa, it was the total polar opposite. So I started photographing all the young people. And then I realized this might be a story. I'm just going to focus on the youth of South Africa. But then I thought, that's too big. How can you focus on the youth of a country? Who are you going to photograph? And then I knew I had to narrow it down a little bit. And I narrow it down to the people who were born after 1994, after Nelson Mandela became president and apartheid stopped. So during apartheid, I'm sure all of you know, 
there were strict laws. You had a black school, a people's um, a school for black people, a school for white people, a swimming pool for black and white, uh, black and another one for white, and everything was divided. I knew that when I moved there, and being white, I felt that weird privilege, that very crazy racism that you feel in South Africa much more even than anywhere else, I feel. Um, I felt it constantly. So I started focusing on that and I photographed youth. I was planning to photograph youth for one year and then I thought two and then it became 12. So sometimes you just don't know. So this first story I'm gonna show you that's part of this project I was made in 2010. I hardly had any money, like photojournalists do, and I was back in the Netherlands, and my big dream was to be back, to go back to South Africa. But how? I didn't know. I didn't have the money to fly back. But the World Cup was coming up, and I got an assignment to photograph the hotel rooms where the Dutch players, the soccer players, would be sleeping. Super boring assignment. I didn't like it at all. But I went and they paid my ticket and they paid the hotel and it was perfect. And while I was there, I got a phone call from a journalist in South Africa who said, Ilvi, you have to come to Johannesburg. Leave the World Cup story. Come fly here because Eugene Terblanche, this guy, just got killed. He got stabbed in his body many times by the black workers working on his farm. And Eugene Terblanche was an extreme, extreme right-wing white Afrikaner, a very scary man who during apartheid wanted to start his own white state, his own white country, only for white people. He was an extreme right-wing man and I decided to fly to Johannesburg from Cape Town and photograph his funeral. I was hoping to find young people there. I can tell you all, there were no young people. I think I was one of the youngest people there. I was in my early 20s. And this is what the funeral looked like. I remember arriving to the funeral with my two cameras and I saw one of my colleagues, black colleagues that I worked with two years prior at the Star newspaper. And he was a, a black photographer. And I was so happy to see him because he was a good friend of mine, he still is. And I hugged him and while we were hugging, there were two of these white men that walked up to us and they started spitting on us. That's how disgusted they were by the fact I was hugging, or a black, yeah, I was hugging a black guy. That's, and they started spitting on my pants and in my face. And then I decided, okay, I'm really going to photograph this crazy funeral. But it's difficult to photograph racism because racism, you can't really see it. In this picture, you can kind of see it, but still, it's, it, it's very difficult because it's something in people's minds. So I was hoping for young people and didn't find them. But this was a crucial, crucial moment for my career, not the picture itself. It's actually a very bad picture. picture mainly because you see all of my colleagues. That's the one thing you don't want to photograph as a news photographer. And this was the moment the coffin with Eugene Terblanche was being moved into the church. And as you all can see, Mona, please close your eyes. The coffin is not, <laughs> you can't see the coffin at all. The coffin is here. <laughs> so I was really in the worst spot for this picture. It was a lot of pushing and I was pushed towards the entrance of the church and I was stuck. I was stuck in the door, there were colleagues to my left, colleagues to my right and I didn't know which way to go and I couldn't photograph the coffin. And then it got worse. This guy with the hand up like this started yelling at me. You bitch, move out the way, you're in the way, you are scam, stupid photojournalist, uh, like that. And I was so nervous. I was like, what am I gonna tell this guy? And I felt really bad because I don't care whose funeral it is. It's still family gathering. It's people coming together to say goodbye to someone. And I was being, I was standing there and I felt horrible. So in the end, I moved out of the way. I was almost laying like this. 
I took a few pictures of the almost the bottom of the coffin, really bad pictures. And then at the end of the funeral, I decided I should go to this man and I should apologize for the fact that I was in this funeral um, and being disrespe disrespectful. So I walked up to him and he said, he said to me, what were you doing? Why were you there? Why were you in the wrong spot? And I told him I was sorry. And then I asked him, why are you wearing this uniform? Because I didn't know that this was the uniform that the South African army, when it was still during apartheid, had this color uniform. So he said, well, it's the old army uniform and I'm still wearing it because I'm so proud of the old way things were during apartheid when life was still good. And I said, do you wear it every day? Yeah, I wear it to the supermarket and I wear it to everywhere. I was like, okay, this is a story. I want to follow this guy, but he's not in the right age range because I'm doing a story about young people. And then he said, yeah, I also wear it during the youth camps that I organize for young white South Africans. And I was like, youth camps? You're organizing youth camps for young South, uh, South Africans? And he told me he organizes camps where he teaches people, young people, to become more racist. And I was like, oh my God, I want to go to the camp. I asked him and he said no immediately on the spot. He said, you cannot enter. And I was really sad. I took his phone number and I flew back to the Netherlands and the next week I called him and he still said no. I called him every Friday for seven weeks in a row. On the seventh week, literally, he got tired and he was angry. He said, you cannot come and he hung up. Three weeks later, he calls back and he tells me, okay, I thought about it. You can come, we've never had any press at the camp but you can enter. So, with the last of the last money I had, I flew back to South Africa. And this is the first picture I took at the camp. And it was really problematic, because in this picture, you see him sitting there, he looks like a grandfather. He could be a really nice grandfather, or a Boy Scout leader, or anything, but you don't know he's a racist man. And I was, I thought maybe he's a hunter. When you look at this picture, it looks like a hunter. So I didn't know how to fix it. And there was a journalist with me, Alice van Gelder, a Dutch journalist, and she was only writing. And I was only doing pictures at the time. So right at that moment, we decided to make a very bold change in our total storytelling, and we started to do video. We decided we need to record his voice. Hello. We need to record his voice, we need to record video, so people believe the things he was saying, because he was saying things like this, all blacks are barbarians. And we were like, okay, we need audio. But we didn't know how to make video, and we didn't know how to make audio. This is 12 years ago. I had a camera at the time, which was the first camera, the Canon 5D Mark II, that could film. The first camera that could properly film. I just didn't know how. And we had a little bit of reception at the camp, so I was standing with my phone, like this, googling how to do a video interview. How to put which settings, which shutter speed do you need to make video? And we recorded everything, everything. We learned via Google how to kind of do it, and we made a video, and a few months later, it won the first, first prize at the World Press Photo, which changed my career. Completely. I'm going to show you the video now. There was a little bit of a sound issue earlier, but I'm going to hold the microphone to the computer and we're going to make the best of it. Ooh, I really have a bigger issue. Wait. <laughs> now there's no sound. Do you know? But it's going through there. Yeah. Can you turn it on? Yeah. Okay. No, that's not coming out of the laptop. Is it coming through there? Wait. Should we do a... Uh... 
Okay, give me one second. Because I want you to see this. It's a six minute video. We're gonna fix this somehow. Okay, somehow both laptops don't want to do this, but let's see. Okay. Go van Zuid-Afrika, ek hou van ons ruimtes. As die mens hier buiten gaan staan, dan kan jy tot op die horizon omtrend kyk. En jy sien het vlak, en dit is mooi. En daar, jy krijg seker nie in die wereld soveel verskillende natuurskoenis as wat jy in Zuid-Afrika krijg. Ek weet deel geheim om my familie, soos my familie te probeer beskerm en te leer waar gaan het om so'n type persoon te wees, om een rechte man te word, nie meer die sissie nie. Ons het dra die uniform van die oude Zuid-Afrikaanse Weermacht, wat die brein kleren was. Ons het ook een van die uniforms gekry, waar daar een gat dier die uniform gestiet was, en waar daar bloedvlekke op die uniform was. Laat daar geen twyfel wees nie. Behalwe vir die aborigines in Australië, is die swartes van Afrika die mees onderontwikkelde barbaarse specie van die menselike ras op hierdie aarde. Alpha! I don't like like the racism because people tend to get angry at one another and they maybe eat one another. I glue South Africa as a rainbow nation, yeah. Because as you, this means that there are different groups, people or folk, ethnic groups in one land. Look, we have our bases: Kosas, Zulus. Wendas, dan het ons Indiërs. Nee, ek hou maar eerder vast. Nee, met breek nie. Dit vat een les van een uur en ek draai sy kop en ek swaai. Dan weet hy, hy is nie meer deel van die Reenboog nasie nie. Hy is deel van een nasie, een ander nasie, wat een baie trotse verschiedenis het. Hy het genoeg voorsieners maak so wat. Ons is Afrikaners. Ons is een volk in eie recht. Ons 
Zoveel, zoveel disrespect het ons voor jullie dan. Wel in al die eerste het een baie sweet spot ergens in sy hart waar hy omgeef as sy troepe. Nou weet je hoe op lekker trappen mee? Ek voel dat ek die opa vergier is, uh, of, of die vader vergier is ten opzichte van die disease. Nee, nee, ek sê dat nie. Bobby Jan kan nie ver om die boere te verhaar. Dit is een manier om een mens te verhaar. Wat is die grootste verskil tussen jou en een swaard man? Die cortex, onthou die woord, die cortex. Hy kan nie die beplanning doen nie. Nie omdat hy swaard vel het nie, nie omdat hy plat neus het nie, nie omdat hy dik lippe het nie, omdat sy cortex 120 gram lichter weeg as jou cortex. Hy skree, bravo, is bravo op, ok? Hallo, hallo. Oh, ja, sorry. Oké. Okay. Die cortex, onthou die woord, die cortex. Hij kan niet die beplanning doen nie. Nie omdat hy swart vel het nie, nie omdat hy plat neus het nie, nie omdat hy dik lippe het nie, omdat sy cortex 120 gram lichter weeg as jou cortex. Hy skree bravo, is bravo op, oké. Okay. Ja, ons, ons lei hulle speel, speel op. Maar ter selde tyd, terwijl hulle speel, is ons bezig om hulle op te lei vir een oorlogssituasie. Wie is my vijand in Zuid-Afrika? Dat ek tot so'n mate my huis moet en soos een fort moet beveilig? Wie bedreig my tot so'n mate dat ek heel tyd moet uitkyk vir hijjacking? Wie moer Roof en verkracht. Wie is hierdie weesens? Wie denk jullie is dit? Dit is zwart mense. Ek op die grond was, dit het... Ek dit het hard gevoel, dit is slecht, dit is, jy wil nie dit doen nie, dit is... Dit is moeilik, dit is visie seer kruid en dit is, kijk hoe lyk my hande, ek meen, dit is geestelik seer kruid, dit is, jy moet net jyself bewys en vir hulle sê, ja, maar ek kan, ek gaan, want ek wil. Ek wil, ek wil, ek wil, hou die arm stuif. Daar sê, dit lyk beter, dit lyk beter. Dat sê, Arm seer, ek kan nie meer doen wat ons nou doen nie. Ek kan nie meer nie, ek weet ek gaan my te leerstel, maar ek kan nie meer nie. Ja, hierdie kamp bevorder rasisme, maar nie slechte rasisme nie. I thought of a rainbow nation, but there is nothing like that in South Africa. Ja, ek voel nou definitief meer soos Afrikaner. Ek voel daar vloei Afrikaner bloed in my. Ek wil nie Suid-Afrikaans wees nie. Ek wil nie met hierdie reenboognasie geassocieer word nie. Want dit is nie hoe dit moet wees nie en dit is nie hoe dit gaan wees. Van ons land Suid-Afrika as ek lief is vir my eie volk, as ek lief is vir my eie taal, as ek lief is vir my eie kultuur, as ek lief is vir my eie ras, en jy sê vir my, dan is ek een rasist, ja, dan is ek een rasist. En ek is nie skam om te sê, ek is een rasist nie, want as, in hierdie land in Zuid-Afrika, is daar een van twee dinge met die moet lees, of jy is blind, of jy is een rasist. Ons as terwe, Ons vir jou Suid-Afrika. Oké. As a... Thank you.
So it was, thanks, thanks. It was a really, as you can imagine, crazy experience to be at this camp. Uh, because Alice and I really wanted to keep telling the kids to not believe in this guy. But of course, we were there as journalists, so we didn't. We, at one stage, almost wanted to take them out of the camp and leave with them because it was so horrible. And it was so quick. The camp was nine days. And within those nine days, they were totally brainwashed. So in the end, like I said, it won a, uh, the video won an award at the World Press Photo. And it really changed a lot for my career, but it also changed a lot in South Africa and also a lot for the camp. And uh, we were hoping the camp would get banned, that the government in South Africa would see this camp and would say, this is ridiculous, we need to stop. But it didn't happen. The reportage was published in 22 countries around the world. The people were really like, oh wow, does this really still exist in South Africa? And the South African government started an investigation and we were very happy. But after months of looking into these kind of camps, because it happens all over the country, in every school holiday, they are still organized. They found out after the research that this falls within the freedom of speech. So the camps can still continue now, 10 years later, they are still happening. I'm not gonna stop at any of these pictures because they were in the presentation. The reason I have them here is to show the fact that usually when I work for a newspaper, maybe six or five pub uh, pictures are published. Online, maybe 20 or something like that. But in this piece, there were 63 pictures. So it was the first time for me to also kind of be able to show my work in a different way, which really lighted something in my mind that I realized I want to do more multimedia storytelling. So the camp still exists, and I was afraid the guy wanted to kill me the next time I was coming to South Africa. That was my main fear, because I talked to him every week on the phone and tried to kind of befriend him in some way to get into the camp, to like not befriend him, but really win his trust. And he trusted me, and I trusted him, because while I was at the camp, I didn't feel unsafe. If I would have been a black photographer, I would have never been able to enter the camp. So I feel the privilege that I had to be there to be able to tell this story. But I was never afraid of him. But when it published, and it published around the world, from France to Belgium to England, in Telegraph magazine, in Italy, in Denmark, everywhere, in Japan. But then the most important one, of course, was South Africa. And it became a front page story and within the newspaper, a big spread. By that time, the guy was getting recognized all over. The, he was living in Pretoria. When he was on the street, people recognized him because they were playing the video on television there. The newspaper was out. And I thought the next time I'm, I'm gonna reach out to him, he's gonna, he's gonna find a way to get me shot in the Netherlands. There were thousands of negative remarks in the YouTube video. People were very angry at him. But at him, at him, not at me, no. They were not angry at me, they were angry at him for having these camps. But I thought he would be angry at me because there were thousands of people angry at him. By the time I called him, after I got the courage, after two weeks of kind of hiding in the Netherlands, I reached out to him and I was like, oh, I, sorry, hi, here I am. He was happy which made me very unhappy. He was happy the camp got so much attention and I felt horrible. And Ellis, the journalist, felt horrible. The editor felt horrible. We all felt horrible. He was so happy. He was telling us more parents were sending their, parent, their children to the camp. So in the end, it became almost like a commercial in a way. There were thousands of people against him, but there were racist families that were sending their kids there. And we were shocked. It was the first time that we had a story that had this much impact. So we didn't know how to respond to that. There was more, which still till today makes me nervous when I'm telling stories. Because what happened, there were angry people who were angry that, angry people from all around the world as well, but mostly white South Africans, liberal South Africans. They were angry that we showed 
a fringe organization, even though we mentioned in the reportage, in the text, in the video, that it was a fringe, a small organization, people were angry we put attention on the organization. So at that time, I really knew the story I was going to tell about the youth had to be very diverse, not a little bit diverse, not, oh, we have a few, I have a few pictures of black kids and a few pictures of white kids. No, it had to be perfect because I was getting emails from angry white South Africans and I understood them. I was like, I understand you're angry because they were very much against apartheid and they fought against apartheid for a long time. And then they saw this story and they told me, hey, why are you putting all the attention on that story? Which I never knew it was going to win the world press, so I didn't know it was getting published everywhere. So when I continued the story about the young people of South Africa being born after apartheid, I started researching like a maniac. I read every book about South Africa. By that time, I had lived there for three years altogether, but I was flying back in every year. And I found a policy, actually co-written by Nelson Mandela. It was made in 1997 by the National Youth Commission. And in this, in this policy, they wrote about 25 different youth groups. Groups like kids living with disabilities, uh, kids uh, or young people out of school who cannot get a job, uh, young people living in rural areas, young people living and working on the streets. And I realized I'm going to photograph every group I see in this policy and more. I'm going to photograph groups from urban areas, from cities, from uh, farm, farmland, far in the outback of South Africa, rich and poor, Christian, Muslim, everything. So that's where I started, kind of restarted after the camp, which was 2010 and 11. I reached out through youth organizations, but also, also through young people I knew, and I asked them, do you want to be part of this project? I will come to your house, I will stay in your house for like a week or two weeks, and I will photograph whatever you do. The green people that I found through all kinds of different ways said yes. The pink people said, I'll think about it. The red people never responded, and the orange people to be honest, I don't remember this category, but it was mayhem to organize this. In the end, after the camp, I still photographed another eight years, so altogether 12 years. I'm going to show you the pictures I took throughout those 12 years. And when I was photographing it, when I'm teaching, I always tell people, before you start, know what you want to make in the end. Do you want to make a book? Do you want to make an exhibition? Do you want to make a poster series that's going to travel? What do you want to make? That's what I'm teaching people. But to be very honest, when I started photographing these 12 years, I didn't know what I wanted to make. I just knew I was interested in the young generation of South Africa. So I photographed everything. And I'm going to show you some of these images. I tried to focus on different people from different walks of life, like I just said. But I also tried to photograph newsy things, things that were happening in South Africa, like people that we were being pulled out of their homes because they couldn't afford to pay rent for one month. They were pulled out of their houses and all their stuff would end up on the street. It's a very rough society. I, of course, photographed the funeral of Nelson Mandela with 5,000 other photographers. It was really uh, very crazy. There were people praying in the days before his death. There were people praying. I did a whole series on churches and uh, mosques where people were praying for Mandela. This was in the week when he passed away. People were standing in line for three days to wish him a, f a final farewell and to see him laying, lying in state in his coffin. There was a big riot in the end because some people were standing in line for three days and the line was cut off like this in the end and they didn't get to see him. So people were fighting. I also focused on all the different 11 languages and groups that South Africa has. One of the groups is a big Indian community. The Indian community during apartheid was a very special group. 
they were too white to be black and too black to be white. So they had their own set of rules. And even until today, the generation that's now around 20 years old, 25 years old, like Shane, that you see in this picture, Shane still feels like he doesn't belong anywhere. He doesn't belong with his black friends. He doesn't believe uh, belong to this group of white friends. He's right in the middle, which causes him to have a lot of um, depression and ongoing depression for a long time. I photographed him here in a party with his black friends and at the end of the night he said, I just don't feel at home. I love them, but they speak a language I don't speak and they don't speak English when we're all together because they're speaking Zulu to each other and I feel left out. So apartheid on paper ended in 1994 when Mandela became president, but it really didn't end yet. And it's now 20, 29 years ago. Sometimes I just took my camera to random places. A lot of my shoots were planned, but some of them I, I just walked around a lot, going to bars, going to sports fields, going to anywhere. I always make sure when working on a story to also show you know, the area, what does it look like? And this is a very important area. This slum, Kailicha, is only 10 minutes away from the beautiful city center of uh, Cape Town. People that were, these are people that used to live in Cape Town in this beautiful city center with the palm trees and the beach next door. In, in the 1960s, they were pushed out of their homes by the apartheid government and they never got their space back, ever. They're still living here. It's a very unfair for the children that are born in these houses because all the good schools, guess where they are? in the city center of Cape Town, and they are not, it's too far away. I focused on, LGBT, on the LGBTQ community as well, because in 1994, and that's one of the cool things, I think, when Mandela became president, he made South Africa the first country where LGBTQs can get married, so where gay men and lesbian women can get married. Um, and even until today, they are the only country in South Africa. There are many countries where it's very illegal, like Uganda, for instance, and in South Africa, people could get married. Besides video, I focus, or besides photos, I focused on video a lot as well. I interviewed all the people you see in the images. Of, I did a two hour interview with everyone, and I asked them all the same questions. What is apartheid? Do you feel you are being discriminated? What is discrimination to you? It's very interesting to ask this to a, a black rich person, a black poor person, a rich white, poor white, to see how their experience is different. What I try to do when I tell stories is to sleep in people's homes. I hate it, <laughs> but I kind of love it too. I hate doing it because it's very uncomfortable. You're in their space the whole time, but I love doing it because you can get images that you usually you wouldn't be there if the person that cleans the house is cleaning because they will probably invite you after or before. So these images you see here are from the guys that attended the camp. So with five of the people attending the camp, I went to their homes two, no, six months after the camp and one year after the camp and I photographed their families. This was one of the boys, you might recognize him from the camp. This is the sister of one of the boys. I can tell you, this was a very uncomfortable place to sleep as a young female photographer. <laughs> uh, many of the places where I was, was very uncomfortable, to be honest. I often get the question, isn't it dangerous? South Africa at the moment is the country with the highest crime rate, and it has been for many years. So yes, it. As a woman, I see there's a lot of women in the audience. It, it, at many of the assignments I do and a lot of the work I do, it feels unsafe. I've been in situations where I've really been unsafe. Actually, during Mandela's funeral, there was one moment um, when I was photographing in his town where he was born, where I'm very lucky I, I got out uh, in safe, that I got out safe. But what I try to do, and it's possible all around the world, I, I really think so, is to connect to the people I'm following. So they're always close to me. And for some reason, 
I really believe they, they kind of keep me safe as well because I'm with them. And it doesn't matter if they are gangsters or if they're... Somehow we create a bond. I'm photographing them and I therefore feel safe, I guess. I did my whole high school again <laughs> in South Africa. <laughs> I've been in so many schools, I don't ever want to go back. This is Mannenberg, an area I stayed in for a couple of months. It's a crime-ridden area, lots of gangsters. And the reason I went there is because the schools closed down and I saw a little... That's why I think, as a photojournalist, you should read the local papers as well. It was a little article, this size, that said the schools in Mannenberg closed down because of, school sho because of shootings in the street and the children couldn't go to, to the school because they were getting shot in the street by accident, just by passing by. So I was like, okay, let's go. I went there with my colleague Alice and we made a story about people that were going back to school after it opened up again and they were attending a prom. So we followed them and made a documentary about them and photography. And I really felt it should be like flashy and beautiful, you know, it was really, the area was very rough. And for them, this was their one important night, this prom. So I brought a light with me. I don't work a lot with lights. I, I try to keep things natural, but I really wanted them to feel like superstars. And I wanted to have this published in magazines as well, where, um, you know, like a more glamoury magazine. And they, yeah, they loved it, of course, and we loved it as well. A lot of the dresses are either handmade by family members or rented for one night because they have to save up almost four years. Every month they put money aside to go to this prom to just be in a dress for one night. Yesterday when Mona was doing her talk, I don't know who was here during Mona's Bosnax, Bosnax talk. Oh yeah, I see a few of you. We talked a bit about uh, how to become invisible. And being invisible as a photographer, is very difficult in some places when there's so many people in one frame. I used to always wait it out, like especially when being in people's homes, I used to really wait. I would stay there for two weeks and after three days, if they were still looking into my camera, I was still waiting. And then I decided after or during this project, where especially when I'm in people's homes, I tell them like, don't look, like, don't focus on me. I'm not here. I am a fly on the wall. So I would kind of announce, hi, I'm here, but I'm not here. And it works really well, especially in situations like this, when the class is just one hour and all the guys are like this, posing. So I kind of announced that I'm Ilvi, I'm here as a photographer and please ignore me and then I can work. I stayed there for two weeks in the richest boarding school of the country. People pay, or the, uh, the most expensive, 30,000 euro, 30,000 euro for one year. So during apartheid, this was an all white school. No black people allowed on the premises, no people allowed anywhere. Now it's mixed, but a lot of the people, black people in the area cannot afford it. So they have scholarships and it's becoming, as you can see here, a bit more mixed, a little bit, about one third of the boys, it's an all boys school, is black and two thirds are white. But to make a real, it should be the other way around, two thirds black and one third uh, white or even less white. The school ground, the sports grounds were not mixed at all. I don't know why but not at all. Basketball was mostly black people and swimming was all, almost all. There were two black guys in the swim team. So people often ask me, how do you think, where do you think South Africa is going? And before COVID, when I finished the project, I finished it in 2019, I said, it's going well. There's a new president, it's gonna be amazing. I really feel the country is going, is heading in the right direction. I'm taking all of that back because South Africa is currently really since COVID in a problematic state, very problematic. 
Uh, when I finished the project in 2019, I'm saying finished, but it's an ongoing, I mean, it'll never finish. I'm sure I'll go back this year. Um, why am I saying it's worse than ever? When I finished the project, the youth unemployment rate was 58%, 58, which is already crazy high. Then COVID happened, it's 74% now, 74, which means I'm looking at kind of our age group, let's say between 18 and 35 is sitting at home, 74%, it's three quarters of the youth doesn't have a job, it's shocking. Basically, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, but the poor are getting so poor that people are hungry. There's a lot more crime because people are stealing. To f of course, you're, you're gonna to going to steal. This is in a youth prison. The prisons are overflowing, overflowing from wall to wall. People have to stand up to be like, it's crazy. I was in the, in the prison for three weeks I cannot show any of the images or use them anywhere. So I always kind of use this one because I want to be a little bit a rebel. They pulled back uh, 10 years ago, they, they decided they didn't want to have the pictures, of course, because they would look so bad uh, because the kids had to stand up in the youth prison in their cells. As I said, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. So I want to go back this year to focus on a story specifically about youth unemployment because it's the highest youth unemployment in the world, in the whole world. And there's no stories being done about it at all. I want to show you one short video. It's very short, but I want to show you kind of, uh, yeah, this couple that I found right at the end of the storytelling that I was doing, I realized already years ago, I wanted a mixed couple in my stories. But every mixed couple I saw on the street, I would go to them and be like, hi, I'm doing a story about youth and you are a mixed couple. I would really, every time I did that, the guy was from Germany, the girl from South Africa or uh, the other way around. It was never two South Africans. And then I found Wilmery and Zakiti Sakiti is the grandson of Boutelezi, who was in the parliament with Mandela. He knows everything about politics. He knows everything about apartheid. Wilmery is from a small town, from a very religious white family, and doesn't know anything about politics, doesn't know anything. She's quite, yeah, she doesn't know anything about apartheid, about the history of the country, and they fell in love. And I'm just gonna show you a snippet from an hour long doc documentary I made and I'm only showing the part where they are extremely cute. You'll see it now. Okay, the magic, we're gonna do it again. <laughs> we met on Tinder. <laughs> Tinder success story, yeah. they say. Yeah, I don't think either of us actually were intending to get into something. You know, you know sometimes. Love is love. Oh, that's deep. That's <laughs> <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Some people started treating me differently once they knew I had a white girlfriend. Like, how did you get a white girl? Like, it's, it seems so fascinating to some people. And yeah. It's just like... We don't look at each other and be like, oh, you're, like, different than I am. And, like, that makes us interesting. Or, like, ooh, I'm trying something different. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I always get pizza, but, like, maybe tonight I'll try sushi. <laughs> 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 it's not like that. It's just, like, we have, like, a great connection. We really, like, love each other. And we have, like, yeah. a lot in common. It's almost unheard of. Mm. Um, of, like, like, a Zulu and an Afrikaner coming together loving each other so much and like i don't know i'm getting all mushy <laughs> <laughs> so i will in one second i'm gonna show you and then we're gonna round it off i'm gonna show you what i made of the project in the end because finding your visual narrative is not just about finding a story you have to, in the end, also kind of figure out how you want to tell it to your audience. I love exhibitions, so if, I, if it would be up to me, my kind of storytelling, exhibitions, I think it's great because you get to speak to people, you have interaction. 
One other thing I really love, really, really love, is interactive long reads. I've, I do so much video that I, that I, you can make a documentary, but somehow I like online, so it's like, I will show you a little bit of that. Before I do that, I want to quickly go through this, but super quickly, because Mona <laughs> spoke about this yesterday, and I think some of you were there. But I didn't want to take it out of my presentation, just in case there's anyone sitting here who wants to hear this, but I'm going to do it very fast. So, how do I kind of fund myself? As a storyteller, I think we are all struggling um, to find ways to get your stuff in the market and to get it funded. So I tried to find grants. I, do, I did crowdfunding twice. I made 20,000 euro one time and 30,000 the other time, both times by making a book. Uh, crowdfunding is a lot of work, but it's really, it does work. Send in to awards, it really helps. It really, really helps, it gets your name out there. I hear a lot of people, and I know from speaking to some colleagues in the last week, that there's also some of you here that say, but my work is not good enough. I, I'm not sure if it's, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not sure, that, yeah, that's me. Yeah. I'm not sure it's good enough. Well, if you don't send it in, you're pretty sure you're not gonna win. I try to send in every year to the main awards, and you can win or not. I never thought the video was gonna win. I never thought I knew how to do video, but, just do it. It doesn't usually cost anything to send in. If it costs money and you can't afford it, leave that, leave that one. Don't send in. Will press is free to send in. Just try it. Give it a try. You never know. And pitch your story ideas to media. So a lot of the pitching that I do for stories, like I pitched the Born Free story to all the major media outlets. It was published all around the world. I basically try to not bother editors too much <laughs> with long emails. Don't make a long email, they're very busy people. So I try to make a PDF, like a one or two page, few images in it with a text that's really short that describes what you're working on. With Born Free it was a bit difficult to make it short because I worked on it for 12 years, but I had a few of my images, hello? I had a few of my images and uh, yeah, you make a short title, a short text and put it into a PDF. I usually make the PDFs in Canva. It's a free app. You can just get it on your computer or on your uh, uh, phone and it makes beautiful PDFs. I always try to really be clear, uh, like to tell them what I have. I have video, I have audio, I have pictures, I have text um, and what I want, I would like an online publication, or just try to be as clear as, as uh, possible. Well, I think this makes uh, sense, um, especially the social media, try to be, try to show the things you wanna do, not the things you're doing. If you look at my Instagram, you'll see there's a lot of pictures from South Africa because that's where my interest is. A lot of pictures from Africa in general because I, the last 12 years, that's where I've been working. I'm, that's what I'm showing because that's where I wanna be most of the time. Have a professional email address. It just looks more pro. It looks more pro. Not sure what's happening. It isn't me. And try to meet editors at portfolio reviews. And there are editors here, so I, th I know some of you are doing reviews here. So the last thing I want to do is quickly show you what came of Born Free. One of the things is uh, exhibitions all around the world, but I was very, 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 very times 100,000, very unlucky that the project finished right before COVID. So there were exhibitions planned all around the world and only about half of them happened. Luckily, it's picking up now again. It's still happening. So this was in the Netherlands. It was the main exhibition, uh, but it also traveled to, uh, to Oslo, to Germany, to Belgium, to America. It, it went to New York, to Washington. So in the end, it did happen. And I had one specific exhibition that I liked best, and I'm showing it not to show off, I'm showing it just to show you that not every exhibition needs to be the same. This was New York. I had an exhibition at Photoville and I had tear off posters. 
the posters had my name and the caption of everything was on there. I printed 9,000 posters. This is 2019. I'm still getting emails from people who have the poster in their home. <laughs> like, oh, I have your poster. And today I thought, oh, that's right. So it was the best marketing I could ever do. And I didn't know. That's not the reason I did it. Th I did it because I thought it would be nice that people could take home their own exhibition. So I had 9,000 really high quality prints and people they they were f like literally people were standing in line at the container to get a poster for th for weeks like a week on end people were it was the busiest container and i literally didn't plan for it but it was really nice to be able to do it that way so i'll show you some of the publications some of the it was interesting to see the choices people made I'm not going to show them all because it was literally like everywhere. I felt very lucky because I know every, I don't know, It's I feel very lucky to be able to tell the story that I wanted to tell and that it really got published. Like guys, I couldn't believe it. I, I worked so hard. In 2018, the year before it published, I had, a, I had a nervous breakdown. I was so scared it wouldn't get published. So when it happened and everyone published, I was like, okay, phew, phew. But the one thing I wanted to make, and that's the last thing I'm gonna, the one before the last thing I'm gonna show you, was an interactive story. I had 52 hours of video collected. <laughs> 52 hours, the editor hated me. So I made a website, I made a long form documentary, but I also made s a website that you can still visit, bornfreegeneration.com. You have to scroll. It it doesn't work on your phone, and it, there's a reason for that, because you need to experience it on the screen. You scroll 20 minutes, <laughs> and the story unfolds. It, it, it unfolds in video and audio. And there's a long form story, a written story. A lot of this is video. I mean, I can't show the website here because it, there's no internet, but it had two videos on each side all the time comparing the answers of the black and the white people or Indian or rich and poor. So they were, the first the video on the left would play, then on the right. And you could see the difference in answers. Well, as I said, the unemployment rate, it had a lot of stats in it, the website. But also the way I kind of worked, I was reaching out to people and I included that in the story as well. And it all scrolls, it's a big long scroll. And I didn't want to make a book at all, at all, because I felt every photographer has a book and there are so many books and I want a website. And I had like conflicting thoughts about all of this. <laughs> but then Wilmery, the girl you see k kissing on the cover, she's a book designer or a designer. And she said, you're not going to make a book after 12 years. How can you not make a book? And I was like, well, a lot of people have books already and I don't know. And I made one book previously on a total different subject and I hated the fact that all the money went to the publisher and so I never wanted to do it again to be uh, to be honest but then she said you're nuts I'm I'm gonna make a book I'm gonna put myself on the cover <laughs> she did there she is kissing her boyfriend and the book is not really a book it's a I would call it a bookazine I guess bookazine it's a hard cover it's difficult to explain so I made it short, you can see it here. It's a hardcover book. And when you open it, you see that there were 19, you'll see it on the other page, 1994 copies made. So it's a limited edition, but it's a big edition uh, because that's the year Mandela became president. And then you have to twist the whole thing. I know there's a video, but I wanna, <laughs> there. And then it opens up like a full, screen full experience with and it's not posters it's really stapled together so when you work on a story and you found the narrative you want to tell try to find a narrative to match the outcome i didn't want to make a book because it felt too static for me i wanted something that matched this generation these young hip people i was quite younger and hipper when I started this. I'm now a bit older. Um, and I wanted something to match them. And Wilmarie was great. She said, this is 
it's it's a vulnerable book. It really breaks quite easily. It it can tear, but also that makes it fit the young generation. That's a very vulnerable generation. So that's why I made it that way, and Wilmery was the reason for it. <laughs> so she actually um, is the superstar of the book to me. And that's also the one thing that changed in my storytelling throughout the years. It became much more a collaboration while I was working on Born Free. When I was a really real photojournalist, the first years, I would go in with my camera, I would take pictures and I would go back out. When working on Born Free, I knew that's not the way I want to be to st telling stories. I want to go in, get to know the people and ask them, how have you been portrayed before? How do you not want to be portrayed anymore? What are the stereotypes that are constantly happening to your group? And uh, that's why it became a collaboration and that's why the book is uh, from us both, I would say. I guess that's all I have to tell. <laughs> do you have any questions? Ma Maggie, <laughs> the question king, queen, queen. I don't, I think you don't need me? I don't know, can you all hear me? Oh yeah. The Would you rather hear me like this? We want to hear you like okay. that. Well, so here's my question. So you said earlier that when you start a project, you always need to, or you think it's important to have an end idea of how it's going to be presented, either a book or a video or something like that. You have a purpose in mind when you begin. But my question is, have you ever started um, a project thinking it's one thing and when you get into it, you realize that you were completely wrong? And when that happens, do you change your point of view or your approach? And does that then impact the end product Mm -hmm. Really good question. Yeah, so with Born Free, I wish I would have known throughout. The only thing I knew I wanted was the interactive website. Because after winning at the World Press with the video, I knew I wanted to stay interactive. So I always combine things. That's the only thing I knew, but I felt a little bit like I was floating. I've, I would encourage people to kind of think about what you want to make before you start. But it doesn't mean I necessarily do that all the time. Sometimes I don't know. And there was one thing, and I like that part of the question. When I was making a book, not Born Free, but another one, and I really thought I it had to be a book. I knew it. I was working, photographing for one year, knowing that it had to be a book. And while I was making it with the publisher, and it was a really well-known publisher, I realized, crap, I actually don't think this should be a book. I think it would have been better as an exhibition without a book. Like, literally, without a book. I know there's not many photographers who don't want to make books, but I really felt it would have been better in posters, it would have been better in interactive, and I didn't do it because I was younger, and I felt like, I said yes to the publisher, I now have to make the book. So it's a book, and I'm, I mean, I like the end result, I like the book, but looking back, I should have, like, felt my heart a bit more when I was working on it, and I, sh I would have known that it had to become something else, actually. So, yeah, good question. I, uh, and now I try to stay closer to my heart, and when I want to make an interactive website, that's what I'm going for. Yeah. Thanks. Fabulous Thank presentation, you. first of all. A um, <clears throat> couple of questions. The first one is about the book. Did you, uh, this book that was the magazine book, did you make it uh, in South Africa? Ah, good question. No, I didn't make it in South Africa. The um, design was made in South Africa. I was there with Wilmarie when she was designing. All of that was done there. But then when it started, um, when we started looking at the cost of making the book there, it was so much more expensive. I couldn't afford it. So in the end, it was printed in the Netherlands. Okay, it was yeah. printed in the Netherlands. And the second part of my question, or it's not, it's a question, it's an opportunity, it's, uh, it's stimulated by what you've just shown us. Um, I work on a project called Conscience Land. And uh, these issues of youth unemployment and desperation and all kinds of challenges, racism and so on, uh, we're not just in South Africa, they're all over the place. 
And one of the things that we're working on right now is a project called Planetpreneur, an Afripreneur specifically. This is the African Af entrepreneur. So, and this is to solve the sustainable development goals, the UN's sustainable development goals, which have not been addressed by the nations themselves. And now we really need to get on, get on track. And I think it's youth that's gonna do this. And it is done through action. So I hope anyone, yourself or anyone that you know that we can work with, uh, especially in Africa, because this, we're in Africa here in Egypt, but you know, this, this long trip um, to uh, encourage youth. These, you said this 60, what was the percentage of youth unemployment? 74. 74. Highest I mean, this, in this the world. is not even, you know, this is how much mental grief must this be causing? And not only that, where are the leaders of the next generation? You know, are they yeah. sitting at home playing TikTok? I mean, TikTok. playing with TikTok? Um, <laughs> you know, so, so really, seriously, everybody, <laughs> this is an incredibly important thing that we we f stimulate young people to, of course, this is about sustainability, stimulate them to develop their own businesses in their own communities that are addressing uh, the uh, issues of uh, the SDGs. And I hope to work with anybody that's interested in that. I am. Well, great. I am. I and and my name, by the way, is Sustain a Clause. That's why I, it's easy to remember. Sustainability Santa Claus. You can see me at the Sustain a Clause. Sustain a Clause. So that, anyway, <laughs> thank you. I don't want to take too much time. Just want to. No, but it's a great, great subject. And actually, it's one of the things I looked into a few years ago already. Mm -hmm. But then I had to finish this uh, whole project and currently looking for new things. So. Right. Great. Well, we'll talk. See, that's how things <laughs> kind of can happen. <laughs> Um, it's coming your way. Okay. Uh, yeah. First of all, I want to thank you for your great talk. Thank you. And um, I have two questions. Uh, first one is I want to ask you, we've, we've talked about this before, but the money. Again, um, you have like published your work after 12 years, all of it, or did you used to publish like in small projects and publications just to make money and continue your work? Um, this is my first question. Really good question. I forgot to mention it actually. <laughs> it's really, I had to publish small parts. Okay. And the problem was the good stories, let's say the story of the prom, mm. the, with the prom dresses, was very easy to sell. I would show an editor, they were like, yes, we want it. Because it was a subject that was different than others, you know? But I was also including people in my storytelling um, about, for instance, HIV AIDS. And AIDS has been reported on a lot, and in a lot of times in South Africa as well, or connected to South Africa. So those kind of stories, I couldn't sell anywhere. No one was interested. Mm. It's, it's very harsh, but it's true. They weren't interested to publish the stories that were more well known. Mm. So about, I would say about 20% of the stories published during the years, 80% was just sleeping in my laptop mm. and I had to like yeah. sell them in the end. Okay. And the other way I was making money is by doing assignments. I was yeah. very lucky to be able to do a lot of assignments, but if I would have had money or my parents or anyone I know, yeah. I would have not done any assignments because it took my energy and you yeah. only can spend your energy once and I spent all my energy twice. Mm. So. Now I'm out of energy, basically. <laughs> okay, um, sorry, the second question is, um, it's like a personal problem for me, is I don't know how to put together like my story in words. Like, I, I, would, I know, I don't think I know how to take photos, but I'm working on that. Mm -hmm. But putting together things in words and the whole story, I haven't studied journalism and I don't like what I, what I write. So, and I don't know any journal either who, I can work with, so how do you work this around? Mm -hmm. And it's not a, you mean also in your own language, right? Uh, or You mean like in Arabic or English or just my story? No, which, what is your native language? Engl English? Uh, no, Arabic. Arabic. Okay. Do you mean you also have s troubles writing in, uh, like a story in Arabic? Just compiling a story, you mean? Uh, yeah, in Arabic or English. Okay, yes. okay, just so I understood yeah. it correctly. I understand that uh, feeling because when I was studying journalism, I was such a bad writer. The writer 
uh, teacher kept sending me home. That's mm. how bad I was. He didn't even want me in his class. So I understand the feeling. So what I did during school and after, and now working for New York Times, I do the same. While I'm working, I write down the things people tell me mm. and I record them. So that basically means I don't have to rewrite too much because I'm writing things in full quote. Even for Born Free, I had all the interviews that I did on video transcribed by a student. So they typed everything out and that made it a lot easier. I'm not the best essayist. I can't write an essay beautifully. But if I do an interview with someone and I record it, I type what they say or I have someone type what they say and then I can compile it. Mm. Um, so that helped me a lot. And it's a lot of practicing to making it shorter, shorter, shorter. But that's what I would do. Talk to people, write it down exactly or record it, okay. write it. It, it will help you. Yeah. And then maybe try to find someone who can use your notes uh -huh. to make it more compelling. Okay. Thank you so that's much. That's what I did. I'm telling everyone I wrote the whole thing, but <laughs> I actually just kind of wrote down what they said. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Um, You're welcome. I have a comment and a question. Uh -huh. So the comment is about photo books and basically just agreeing with you on the fact that there are too many of them and they're so beautiful. Yeah. But in the end, who gets access or who has the funding to buy them? It feels like sometimes we're just producing them for ourselves yes. and for, for the circle of artists and photographers and ed editors and galleries who can buy them. Yeah, I, s I really agree. So yeah. as much as I love them, I also always have this dilemma. Um, the question is, did you ever like question your status or your position working in South Africa? Was it ever like, like, did you ever have doubts about your position? And why is it that your perspective is better than a South African photographer or like a black photographer's perspective? And how did you kind of, did you collaborate with uh, people there uh, from, from different um, or organizations? And do you feel like it's important to give back also to these communities or is it enough to just document um, sorry, there are too many questions yeah. in one. I'm trying to remember. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I forget anything, let me know. Uh, really good questions. I think in the first years when I was working on Born Free, especially around the time of the camp, so let's say 11 years ago, 10 years ago, I had less of those thoughts. I was studying in 2004 in South Africa and I felt the, the big difference between white and, and black, like the way society looked at us. I felt as an outsider for a long time because I'm white. I'm from the Netherlands who are the, it's the colonial list that came in. So I always felt, I had to, I kind of felt like I was walking around there the first year saying sorry, sorry that my grandparents, you know, exist. And then while working after the camp and diving more into the policy behind things and reading more about South Africa, I began to feel more secure that I could tell this story because I didn't parachute in. I was really researching and knowing and trying to learn the language and so on. So I think for me, the inside voice and the outside voice are both important. But I really think if you are an outside voice, you should really read up. You cannot go to a country, jump in and not talk to the people. And take pictures and go back out. So I really tried to make it more of a collaboration, especially in the last five, six years, I would say, when I was meeting young people through organizations, I would explain it to the organization, what I was doing, and then I would sit down with them and ask them, besides the 20 questions I already asked everyone, I asked them, how have you been portrayed in the past? Not you as a person, you as a group. What is it you don't want to see Again, you know, what is it, like I said earlier, what are the stereotypes? And I think that really helped me to realize I'm less of a photojournalist and more of a, it was more of a collaboration. The first project I did like this, but I now have it in my backpack, this knowledge of how to collaborate instead of jump in and shoot. And I take it even on shorter assignments. I work, I try to work in this way. 
I still feel being white gave me the privilege to do certain stories that another person with another color couldn't have made. I mean, like I said, with the camp, if I would have been a black photographer, you would have not seen that video. It wouldn't exist because they would never have let me into the camp ever. Uh, the schools, I think the schools in general were quite okay having me. Um, but I think everywhere I was more privileged. Well, not everywhere, because in black areas I was, it was a bit more difficult for me to work sometimes. Because people, yeah, they, it depended where you were, but there were some areas where people were really not so happy of me being there. So it was a bit of both, yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about uh, the name of the book, Born, um, Born Free. Yeah. It was like that, if I remember. Yeah. But um, why you choose this name, especially that they, uh, their community full of racism? And, uh, and um, this the story, the I think... Uh, Say again? Their, their community, t they are still black and white. They, didn't, they still have this uh, yeah. thinking. So why you choose this name? Good question. Um, I was trying to find the full title of the book, but I now realize it's on the side of the book and I didn't photograph it. So the full title is Born Free, Mandela's Generation of Hope. And the reason it's called Born Free is because this group has an official name and it's called Born Free. So everyone born around 1994 when Mandela became president, they're born free. So my first idea was to do it like this, Born Free, you know, with, uh, what's it called, brackets? Because it's not free, that's why. But then the designer said, mm, it's not nice to have a quote as a title. So you should add Mandela, Mandela's generation of hope. And then in the intro, uh, you can't read it, it's a bit too small. But it explains that it's uh, the born free generation and that they are called like this. But that the freedom is like this. Yeah. Good question, thanks. Are we stressing for time? I think we are. Oh, kind of. I'm just what, like one more or? Yoo-hoo. Hi. Then I'm gonna stand. <laughs> uh, so um, how, do, how did you handle with the idea of being a female and uh, go to places you even don't know uh, the risks you could have and be so open to, to work with them and um, you know don't be afraid of being in danger they are races or uh, or not and this is stuff how you handle with with it in everywhere and is this is effect on you on your uh, in the way you work or not hmm, good question i like all the questions they're all very good um i would say as a female photographer the older i get the less trouble I have, I must say. But 10 years ago, I really felt afraid many times. The reason I was not feeling afraid during Born Free is because the Born Frees themselves, who I contacted before I would meet them, they were very protective over me because I was in their area, I was in their street, I was in their house, I was in their country, and they wanted to make sure I was okay. So they were with me most of the time. If they were not with me, any of the born frees, I was uh, sometimes with a fixer, someone who would be with me to, to kind of make sure I was okay. So that helped as well. And I think the other thing that helped me, but I'm not advising, and it's not an advice because it's, it worked for me, it might not work for anyone else, but I always try to think positive. I really believe in the end, all people are good. So I also really believed if it's gonna go bad, if I get raped or attacked or any of the, if it's if it's happening, I still believed, it's, it's like a mental game, that I could talk this person out of it. That I could say like, I don't know, I just believed it. And by having that belief gave me the freedom to keep shooting. If I would have believed all day long I was in danger, I could not have taken any picture. So in my mind, I felt safe always, even though I'm 100% sure I wasn't safe always. That's kind of how I worked and it worked for me, but I don't know, it's not the best advice. But I do think as a female photographer, 
you are more at risk in most places, definitely. So you have to have eyes here, eyes here, eyes on the side. And you have to make sure that you are as safe as you can be. Lock your door when you're in the car. Make sure your equipment is not showing uh, in the most dangerous part. Uh, <sighs> At night, I would walk around with like the key between my fingers so I could like s uh, stab someone if I needed to, like things like that. You think about it. Yeah, um, but I think about it always. Here in the Netherlands, it's not only in South Africa. So, so far it has worked, but yeah, it's a crazy job. All right, that's it. So please give it up for uh, Alvi. And uh, the token of uh, appreciation and gratitude for your presence here with us in Cairo for the week, we would like to present this little trophy. Uh, the thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's been great having you here with us. Um, and we really appreciate the effort in coming all, all the way down here in Egypt. Thank you very much. It's highly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Right, everyone, thank, thank you. you.